morning, everyone. On the show today, we have a very special guest. Guest. Her name is Shoakwe Akinpelu. She is the co-founder of a digital marketing company called um, Her Invest, which is dedicated to reaching underserved women. She provides them financial and non-financial services, and she's also the author of the book called Stripped, her own version of um, a woman's guide to building wealth. I would describe her as a serial entrepreneur, and we're so happy to learn from all her wealth of experience today. Nice to have you on the show, Shalapi. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bumi. It's a pleasure being here. Hello, everyone. How are you today? Okay, great. So I wanted to start with your background, but before I do, it would be reminiscent of me not to congratulate you on your achievement at featuring at the NASDAQ um, Tower in uh, New York, the Times Square. So could you just explain to us what the achievement was that made them feature you and maybe a background as to how you joined their um, incubator? Thank you so much, Bumi. So um, NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center has this program for entrepreneurs. And um, it's a global one where there's a call for applications from entrepreneurs solving for different problems across the world. Um, at the end of the day, out of 1,000 applicants, 12 um, successful applications are granted three months of thorough mentorship and coaching to achieve a major milestone um, for the organization. So it's called the Milestone Makers Program. Um, so um, thankfully, I was one of the last, I was one of the 12 in the last Milestone Makers Program of the NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center. So um, that highlights on the um, NASDAQ's board at Times Square in New York is one of the highlights of our graduation. So 12 of us and our businesses are highlighted there you know, to celebrate what we do. So it was really, really great to flag the Nigerian flag, the African business spirit high up there. Yeah. Well, congratulations again. That is definitely an achievement. And it only goes to show um, how phenomenal what you are building is. So maybe you can start with giving us a brief, brief background as to what led you up until now to the point that you've reached so that our listeners can understand um, a bit about you personally and then also your business accomplishments that have brought you finally to where you are? Um, so it's still an ongoing journey. Um, one that most of the time, the way I look at it is, oh, you've not even started at all. Um, but, you know, different people have said we shouldn't look at it that way. But because when I look at the problem that brought me into, you know, co-founding and starting, starting Harvest, um, it's a huge one. Um, not to bore you, my background, I've said it several times, was actually in marketing communications, but then I was doing this for different financial organizations from both agency side, and my last role was at Meristem. As the head of marketing, Meristem, by the way, is an investment um, firm, a conglomerate, so um, stockbroking, asset management, asset management, rather, um, trust, we just talk about all of that they were into that and so with them we were building products rolling it out and so you know when you're constantly studying i've always been a life i'm a, I'm a lifelong learner right so when you constantly study i realized that a lot of women were not using financial services as they should and it was um holding them back from participating fully at an economy you know that offers you know um, um as much access as you take even though there are some systemic you know, challenges as well, but even the internal biases were there. And yeah, I always say that Harvest is, you know, a story of insight leading to actions. So when I started looking at the problem, I realized that a lot of work had been done, a lot of work in terms of research, like millions of dollars had been committed to researching about a problem that we all could see, that yet nothing was getting done. And that was when, you know, I decided that if, if not, if not, why, why not us? Why not me? Why not you shall have to solve this? And so basically, Harvest today is lifting financial participation for women, both financially underserved and financially excluded women, basically rural women, urban women, um, and we're giving them access to savings and impact investment and credit. And our credit goes to low-income women communities and smallholder female farmers and um, traders. Okay, and are most of your target um, customers in 
um, Lagos or outside of Lagos or the West or the North, you know? Yeah, so, you know, I've said that um, the business tends to both um, underserved women who are usually urban women, but they don't have enough access to finance or it's even in some cases, it's just um, um, learning, education, financial literacy that a lot of people need or the know-how just to be handled. So we um, currently have a mobile application where we have tons of financial education, um, savings access, automated savings, impact investment and the likes on the mobile application. And, you know, I mean, that can be used anywhere with the penetration of the Internet. Um, but for our credit, um, most of the beneficiaries of the credit, we go to communities that need it the most. And small of female farmers are one significant community of women that have been held back from accessing financial services, particularly credit as they need it. So what we offer them is yes, we offer them the credit, and and then we, you know, also offer um, trainings, you know, uh, on good agronomy practices. Just the same way we are offering financial literacy on the other side, yeah, and then we connect them to markets. Okay. So that's what we do on both sides, and then that we have our women across different states. Okay, so I'm trying to imagine how it all went. How it all was when you started as in you were in mary stem and you left did you have enough funding when you started what did you look for first the funding or the customers you know how was it like at the very start okay you never have enough funding that's one thing i've realized and the life of a business as long as the business is growing you never have enough funding <laughs> again um but at the beginning you know um uh, um what did we do first the customers or the money is a chicken and egg situation you need money to get the customers you exactly. need the customers to make the money um but i would say that uh, when i started i had saved up you know i had some mentors and i'd seen people who had gone from nine to five into you know the entrepreneurial journey so i made them my friends you know they mentored me they coached me i do that now you know, um, for people around me. Um, so they had said at the minimum, have six months of worth of, you know, your lifestyle, right? And then another um, six months that can run the business, okay? And so that was what I thoroughly, thoroughly saved up for. And um, I must say that it was never enough. At the end of six months, we were almost burnt out. But then we now have to start seeking for fundings from family and friends you know and the likes yeah and you know th there are quite a number now not as not not enough though, but there are quite a number of digital platforms dedicated to women so how do you distinguish yourself amongst um the few that there are okay well to, you know to start with i always say that if we have you know 20 gender lens financial institution if we have 40 if we have 50 of them in nigeria and africa today it is not enough for the challenges on ground for the gap that we see. Yeah. If, we are, if the um, um, AFDB is estimating $42 billion gender gap, um, that was how many years ago? With the bulk of it trapped in other culture anyways. I mean, how, how, how many organizations can possibly unlock that um, trapped capital? Um, so yes, we, have, we are happy to see you know, um, financial financial institutions laser focused on, you know, um, 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 gender capital, gender financing, and even existing and established organizations we respect making um, tons of efforts in financing the gender economy. Um, on how we distinguish, it is usually, um, what I'll say is that um, by nature and as the leader of this organization, I thrive in queues, I... I, I, I love solving complex problems, complicated problems generally. And that's one of the things that has led us into solving for, you know, um, rural women. It is, it doesn't make a lot of sense for a lot of businesses because they feel like, oh, it's a lot. And it's capital intensive, it's time intensive. You know, you can easily get lost in, in it. And, you know, but um, again, because we are very impact focused and impact oriented, I want to, you know, we have a clear business case that, you know, business and impacts don't have to be sacrificed for each other. So we keep devising new methods, innovative methods on how we can make both thrive, make it make business sense, 
make you make impact sense and i think that has been one defining difference that we have in the market and we are pleased to lead okay I, I was just wondering when i was looking at your website how how easy it was to penetrate the segment for rural women as in how do you get them to you to be digital when um it's not what they're used to so how are you able to achieve any milestone in that sector considering that it's actually very it might actually have been very difficult yeah so trust me it is not we've not even gone that path that, that is trying to digitize because that's another business entirely trying to digitize uh, or yeah. teach women that are not traditionally digital how to be digital but what we've done is to serve them what they understand and know what's on the menu right um so so right. so and that is you know using the us as the solution they buy recharge cards they dial star so 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 we have digitized um um the lending part the the education the financial education the good agronomy practices education you know and even them opening a wallet by a US that is Star on two one three, which is available on MTN network, and we are working on having that on other networks at the moment for the end of the year. So you see, um, it's it's because it's a, it's the solutions, the challenges are custom, so the solutions need to be custom and highly localized as well, and that's what you know we've done. Okay, well, great job so far, I must say. Thank you. Okay. So, but you 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 run harvest. You you run it with a, another person, a co-founder, right? So, I wanted to understand how easy it was to find a co-founder, knowing that sometimes businesses collapse because um, the wrong co-founders have merged together. So, how how did you find the right person? Uh, well, I must um, firstly attribute that to God. That um, in our case. I mean, this morning now, we've spoken, we've chatted, we're in each other's homes, we know our personal, do you understand, um, my co-founder, your me, the wife is my, is like his sister, my husband is like your me's mentor, you know, we have a very beautiful relationship, and speaking about how we met, we're actually former colleagues, we're good colleagues at, you know, Mary Stem, as I've said earlier. And, you know, journeying through life, you just never know. I mean, when we met, we met in 2015, right? That's eight years ago. If anyone had mentioned that, okay, in the next or so years, you two will be starting a company, and then, you know, someone would have, would have like, you know, so, so that's why I just say that um, social capital is a huge, you know, capital that a lot of us take for granted, and then we just focus on money. We can do a lot with the human capital around you and you know how are you nurturing those so basically that's how yomi and i met um he's a software um engineer with with um with he's a software engineer with you know diverse experiences and so um we are no 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 with transparency right um on both sides it just it makes it easy like nothing to be hidden nothing to be you know Okay. And how was it like um, getting the word out when you first started? Did you have to do a lot of advertising or did you grow organically? Was it word of mouth? You know, how did you grow? I know you're a communications expert. So how did you make it? Uh, how did you create the brand that is what we know today? Well, I'll say that it was more of an organic thing, right? Um, because even till now, we've not run any major marketing uh, campaign. We've not you know, as far as we're concerned with marketing, we haven't, we've not started, right? But um, the traction that we have has been largely word of mouth. And then maybe because it's niche, you know, so women would generally, you know, tell other women about it. I think women, if you look at, you know, them driving consumerism and their buying patterns, they, we are very head-like. So, oh, shall I, try, I like your red lipstick. If you tell me that, I'll say, ah, Bumi, you love it. Ah, I got it here. You know, <laughs> that's our usual pattern. So I yeah. think that helped, right? That is one a user telling another user to say, oh, I use this product, by the way, and it's really good. So, um, yeah, and that's why we keep improving on the product because we know that if the product is great, um, um, people would always share the good news. 
plan so how do you create a great product as i'm just thinking about it because you can be in the back background creating something and you think that it is great but until you actually test it until people use it and comment and say, and give you the feedback that is actually great that you know that it is so how how do you create something that people love because definitely for the traction you've achieved you must have created something that people love to use yeah i'll say that um market research is really key and that was one of the things that we um did well when we started run a lot of surveys um um spoke with a lot of people and we still keep, we keep doing that to iterate, right? So I think because you do you don't you don't build for yourself, you build for people, you build for your users, yeah. and so they are taught what their needs it supersedes whatever you know you feel best in so many cases, right? Um, and so I think that's one thing that we've done well um, before we started, and we keep doing well. That is listening, 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 listening. You can over listen. You know to your users you can over listen to your customers or clients but you can under listen <laughs> hi guys it's bumi smith from your very own the money buff show and i want to quickly drop a few words of thank you so if you've been watching my show and you've gotten one or two things and you've continued to watch thank you for being a solid listener and viewer and if you're watching my channel for the very first time, thank you as well. And if you haven't yet subscribed, I want to encourage you to subscribe because I'm building a community. And the more subscribers I have, the more I can get people that you know and love to interview. So please continue to watch. Please continue to like and share. And please don't forget to subscribe. Thank you. Oh, that's fantastic. That's really, really, really great. So let me, let me digress a bit to your book, Stripped. An African Woman's Guide to Building Generational Wealth. So the, the the context of the book, is it based on your own experiences or experiences of other people that have worked for you or have worked for them? You know, what, what what's the background about the book and why were you motivated to write it? Okay, so um, about streets. Now, in short, when I told a few people that I was writing a book, they said, yeah, is it about your life? Is it about, I said, no, what have I done? Why am I writing a memoir? <laughs> right? Um, I said, okay, it's okay to write a memoir. I said, no, 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 I don't think so yet. I mean, we're still very, very active. Um, but every time, because I'm a certified financial educator myself, and every time, you know, I speak at public um, events or, you know, and I speak about finances for women, the biases, the challenges, how we can overcome them, how we can be, you know, financially resilient, you know, how we can overcome the cultural challenges and, you know, all of that. People would now say, okay, Shalaki, thank you. You've spoken so much. You've shifted our minds. How do we, you know, how, what action do we take? How, what do we do from here? And then there are tons of things that they can do. And because, you know, as personal finances, it is personal. What works for you are based on your own circumstances. Your, there are many things. There are many, many variables. Your personal income, your household income, your um, um, money DNA, your money personality, your black tax level. Your, there are different things. So it's just hard to say, okay, you know what? This is what you should do save this percentage in this, go into um, fixed income, do one, do one. You know, it's not it's not that easy. People do that, right? But again, you know, it's not exactly, um, 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 it's not so effective on the long run. And that was why I wrote Street, an African woman's guide to building generational wealth. For every woman that had read it, you know, it's just a case of physician, I mean, it's just a case of work out your own salvation. Do you understand? based on your soul in streets is divided into three you know categories how to make money how to grow money and then how to transfer that wealth because generational wealth has to be transferred because before it becomes generational wow i i, I must say that you are you are a great writer very engaging when i read some of your posts how you you weave lessons in stories you should you should write the second book you know because it's always um 
interesting and um you want to read on because the person that is writing is good in storytelling you know but there's always a lesson in between what you're saying you know so how do you think this skill of storytelling is something that all entrepreneurs should have in selling their business their brand you know what's your opinion on that yes i believe so um i believe so and you know as as african founders i think that is also one strength that we have and we don't tap into uh, because we grew a lot of us grew uh, i mean i mean into folklore um from a big circle i don't know i'm not that old old <laughs> i'm an 80s kid <laughs> Right, it's just me that is. Um, but but you know, we used to see it on NTA, you know. So we have this storytelling yeah. thing embedded in our DNA, and you realize that story stick. I can come on this conversation now, uh, um, or come on this call or another conversation and just go on and dish fact, fact, fact. Trust me. By the time you stand up, you've forgotten how for it. But if I tell you relatable stories, it sticks, you can relate, then you can work out your own solution by yourself. And so it is a, yeah. it is one that I recommend, not just founders. I mean, I'm an entrepreneur and 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 um, a career person. I mean, the storytelling just works, and it, there's a way it makes you distinct and easily people can easily recall you know you so it's a gift um to be honest um but it's one that can also be nurtured right okay so because i'm referring to your storytelling uh, abilities i have to refer to the story you told about kids we and it's prompted me to ask you as to um what led you to close that business i, I asked that question because you know, there's always the question of when something isn't working, for instance, do you continue to work on it until it does? Or how do you know when to say, to close a chapter and say, um, this isn't working, let me move on. And that's not to say uh, kids way wasn't working, because I, I don't know why you you um, you stopped it. It's just to understand from your wealth of experience and advise people on what to do on, on how to persevere. Yes, um, so... You've, you've obviously made some good research and I love that. Interestingly, just yesterday I was at a meeting and because my number is still on the Kids Way Google business thing out there, I still get these frequent calls. And you know, because it's back to school season yeah. now, yesterday I was at a high level meeting and a call came in and I just did call me back. And the person I said, I urgently need a pair of shoes. And I'm like, okay, would this business ever leave me? <laughs> and I had to say, okay, madam, sorry. I do not run this business again. And, um, you, you, you know, so here's the thing. And I've, I mentioned this, I tell people, um, first off, you know, when you said that's not to say kids it wasn't working, as at the time that I shot kids way down, it wasn't exactly working again. When I looked at the numbers, the cost we were, um, um, the, 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 the cost we were accumulating on grants, you know, on operations, it was almost exceeding you know um the 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 revenue Perfect. and all of that yeah so it just didn't it didn't make any sense and so i'll tell you this for free when i was going to shut that business i shot it for two reasons one was because of how the numbers were going and secondly i needed to really focus which is a big reason too though you, it seemed like a huge risk then but i really needed to focus on you know harvest right um, so if your numbers were great, maybe I would have said, okay, I'll get someone to manage it also so I can focus. But it gave me, a, it was just easy to let it go because of the numbers. But everyone, I tell you, everyone yeah. around me felt I shouldn't close it. I mean, from family, friends, everyone. I mean, you know, different cultural reasons. And that's why I tell people, even investment, we still approach it culturally. You know, ah, don't, the stress, ah, what will people say? Because it's on a major road in Lagos. A lot of people knew kids' way, right? I mean, you know, so what people yeah. say, I say, why, why would anyone want to say anything? Okay, well, let them talk. I mean, <laughs> it's not. So it's a business decision that I had to make. And this is to say that if it's not working, right, 
try salvage it. If you can't, there's no point sinking for that money. At times, maybe what you need to salvage it is even maybe knowledge, better business practices and all of that. As at the time, if, if, if I had to go back in time now and run that business, I wouldn't even incur um, physical rent. Do you understand? In the first place, it doesn't because most of yeah. our sales were even coming digitally. Do you understand? So there are many lessons to look yeah. into that. But most importantly, I see women, you know, men, men women mostly, so they so that they can go somewhere. Can go somewhere. Wow. It's just if you don't place a value on your time, right? You know, yes, and that's the that's the only resource that you have that's no 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 um infinite, right? You can't yeah. go back to claim yesterday's time. So yeah. Wow. Great insight. Okay. So I have I have two questions in one to ask you based on the fact that you, you've operated a side hustle and you've been a solo founder. So first question, it, since you've experienced both being a co-founder and being a solo founder, which one do you think um, is better? Because they say if you want to go um, fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go with people you know but um if you don't find the right co-founder like i said before it could be it could slow you down so which one which one do you think in general works um best then do you think or do you advise people to have side hustles first before venturing into full-time entrepreneurship okay so i'll take the first question um firstly i'll establish that i started harvest alone Right. Um, it was towards the end of the first year or so, right, that um, our co-founder Yomi joined. Um, and I always tell people this, if I was going to start, do another startup now or run any other, I mean, high growth startup, I'm never starting it alone and I'm not even doing it with one person at the minimum, less be four. Yeah. It takes a lot. It requires a lot. What is required is balance. If all of us, if all people are coming, rules should be clear. Strength should be weighed. All of us cannot have strength in the same place and then we come together. I mean, let's have, you know, diversify strength. Um, or with a minimum of two. Um, that being said, being a solo founder you know can be a curse and a blessing at the same time because what it means then is that you know you don't have your decision making is not so extended but you can easily make wrong decisions too because hey it's just you and it's quite hard running a startup anywhere in the world is hard it's just hard a lot of founders like i say are in therapy which is good you know if we find ourselves in therapy that means we are on our way to on our pathway to healing right rather than you know slogging it out and refusing help um a lot it, it's just super hard so i would say i would recommend you know not going it alone but if it requires it because if i'd waited and didn't go it alone when i did there might not be a harvest today right so but if you can go it alone and you get people alongside the way fine if you can go it alone and you know, body is like we say alone. That's fine too. Yeah. You know, but make sure that you have enough support system around you, um, a healthy advisory board, a sound board. You know, people generally that can give you sound advice and sound judgment. Um, your next question, I've forgotten now. Sorry. <laughs> I was asking about your experience um, having a side hustle first before starting full-time entrepreneurship which which one do you think is better to have mm. that experience first or to start it um to, to each his own so um on on um start doing a side or so or i'll say do what works i mean um if you can right and it's not in conflict and it doesn't steal your time away from your employer is recommended and i would also say most importantly starts with um this size of fund or capital and then you can now iterate and start putting a lot of capital as you see how it works or pans out so don't put a lot of money at the same time yeah right 
Okay. I, I have two more questions for you before I let you go. Okay. So second to the last. Um, I know you've received um, support from institutions like Google, INSEAD, um, NASDAQ, um, Entrepreneur Center. So do, how do you how do you access these kinds of support? I, I'm assuming that they might be um, both financial or non-financial. You know, I know that there will be an application process, but what makes you stand out? What makes you successful in your applications? Hmm. That's a tough one. <laughs> and I think it's best answered by the jury of these applications, <laughs> right? Um, <laughs> but, but, but largely, what I'll just say is that, and I want to encourage a lot of entrepreneurs, people seeking for scholars, there are so many opportunities out there. There are so many, many opportunities out there. You know, like you rightly said, some of these opportunities didn't come with money, but they came with lessons that can unlock capital for us. Um, they came with visibility that can unlock capital and goodwill for us. Um, so first thing is to actively, actively, you know, look for these opportunities. It is critical. It is key. The work of an entrepreneur is so daunting. Most of the time, you are face down, just into the work. But once in a while, you have to, you know, you can't keep winking in the dark, like you say in marketing. So you have to look up and see, okay, what are the opportunities around me that can make this work lighter? What are the opportunities around me that can make the journey faster, you know, and keep applying for those? You know, I wouldn't say that it is for um, any particular reason, you know, because I see different... I've seen very interesting businesses, interesting models. Um, but if you do not apply, they can only take as much, um, they can only take um, from the pool. Um, so if if you do not apply, I mean, really, you stand no chances. So let's just, yeah. you know, have that mindset. Okay, my last question. So where do you see Harvest in the future? What's your future plans? Oh, yeah, we are building a global brand. And if you ask anyone who works with Avis, that's what they tell you, that we are building a global brand. And that's why um, in approach, in positioning, in how we serve, in our level of service, right, we are building a global brand. Um, we are not willing to cut corners or place more. So in the next one year, two years, if you hear that, oh, um, Harvest is in um kenya oh harvest is in do you, do you understand i mean yeah that's it because we believe amen that the problem we are amen amen to that because really that the problem we're solving for is not just local one you know yes we want to deepen yeah. here um but most importantly you know we are willing to you know spread the solution across all right it's been a pleasure talking to you Thank you so much for taking the time out to join, okay. to share your wealth of experience. Um, I usually ask my guests if they will uh, refer, because I think refer is a great way of building anything. Refer another guest that they believe um, can share their story for our listeners to learn from. So I'll be reaching out to you afterwards for a referral. I hope you would not mind that. Sure. I will. No problem at all. Bye. I will. All right, it's been all great right. talking Thank to you. Thank you, Bonnie. Have a lovely day. Same here.